What is Christmas? It's a fresh opportunity to remind you as you approach this new year, bow down. Recognize his lordship and confess it. If we confess him, we get delivered by him. That means you can't be a secret agent Christian. And Christmas is a reminder to come out and be known as a follower of Christ. That I belong to Jesus Christ and that I bow down. I hope that this has been a meaningful series uh, thus far as we're completing our four-part series on the, on the meaning of Christmas. It is my contention that its real meaning has gotten lost in our culture, in our lives, and even some, to some degree in our churches. And I just want to remind us of things we probably already know but, but need to be reminded of about what makes this holiday so powerful and so special. Uh, if you are, are, are viewing and you have not seen the previous three sessions where we dealt with uh, the person of Christmas, where we dealt with the purpose of Christmas, where we dealt with the uh, perspectives of Christmas, uh, then feel free to contact us at The Urban Alternative and get the, the whole series on uh, the meaning of Christmas because this is a most important holiday because it surrounds a most important person. Everyone who knows me knows that I love football. Football is my favorite pastime. I'm passionate about it. When I was young, I was passionate about playing it. When uh, my son came along, I was passionate about following him when he played it. Uh, so I'm passionate about football. Everyone who knows football, looks at football, follows football, understands that it's all about the football. <laughs> I mean, everything in the game is about this pigskin. Uh, first downs are determined by where you place that football. Touchdowns, whether that football breaks the plane of the goal. Uh, incomplete or complete passes, did you catch the football? The placement of the ball is where the ball was when the, when the runner fell down. Uh, when you have field goals, it's did the ball go between the uprights. It's all about this football. It, it's amazing that this piece of leather has spawned a multi-billion dollar business. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I mean, right. it's made millionaires out of people. It's brought sponsors in. People eat and drink around it. Televisions are turned on to it. All because of the positioning of this one little thing. So this one little thing is bigger than this one little thing. Yes. Christmas, it's about this one little thing that isn't so little because it's affected the world. You think about it. Jesus Christ never wrote a song that there are more songs written about him than any person in history. Uh, he never wrote a book, but his book, the Bible, has outsold every other book in history. Um, he never traveled more than 300 miles from home, yet you can't go anywhere in the world where his name is not referenced and where he is not recognized on some level. So... This is not an ordinary name, like a football is not an ordinary ball. It, it has spawned all kinds of things from it. All in his name. Because Christmas is about Jesus Christ. At our church, I have a master key. And this master key unlocks all the doors. Individuals have individual keys, but I have a master key that can go anywhere in our facilities because it's designed to work everywhere. Jesus Christ is the master key to understand Christmas. But how do you get this master key to unlock doors in your life? How do we make Christmas and its meaning practical and prevalent for your everyday life and your everyday living? Well, we've been using Matthew chapter Two, chapters one and two, really, but chapter two, and I want to look at one verse. We talked about the wise men who, 
who brought content into Christmas because they came to worship him. And then when they come to where Jesus is, after they found the way to go, they had seen the star, verse 9. And they came and stood in the place where the child was. Remember, he's a child now by the time they arrive. And coming into the house, he's in the house, he's not in the inn. He's a toddler now. With Mary, uh, the mother, it says, they fell to the ground and they worshiped him. How did they worship? They fell to the ground. They bowed down. How do you respond to Christmas? You bow down. You bow down. Now the Bible is clear. The Ten Commandments makes it clear. You only worship God. You worship God alone and you bring no other gods before him. None. And yet they fall down and worship a baby. Uh, well, now a toddler in a house bringing their gifts to him. But if you only do that for God, by God's own commandment, and you worship the son and God endorses the worship because he comes and guides them right after they worship, then Jesus Christ is recognized as God because God says you can only worship God. That's right. And they bow down to him. They yield to him. If you really want to get all out of Christmas that Christmas is designed to give you, you want to bow down. That is, submit your will, your life, your purposes, your passions. All of life is to surround the worship and the recognition of Jesus Christ. They bowed down and then heaven spoke. This is more than going to church. This is more than having a service. This is a recognition of his kingship and lordship. Why is this important? Because the Bible says that there's only one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. He is the mediator. He's the in-between person. He's the link to bring heaven and earth together. When Jesus Christ is excluded, the link is missing. And when the link is missing, then there's a gap between heaven and earth. God wants to close that gap through the bowing down to Jesus Christ. That's why I love so much Philippians 2, which brings out this principle. It kind of summarizes everything we've said in these three sessions thus far and concluding within this fourth session. It says, have this attitude in you, which was in Christ Jesus. So I want you to think like Jesus thought. Who also, he existed in the form of God. He existed in the form of God. That is, he was deity. You can't exist in the form of God unless you are in fact God. But he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to at all cost but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant. The Greek word there is doulos, and it meant a slave. And being made in the likeness of men. So he existed as God, but he got made in the likeness of man. Remember the hypostatic union we talked about? Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him, Jesus, the name which is above every name. Remember, he's Emmanuel. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. That's what the wise men just did. Remember, they fell down. Of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wow. 
If you really want to get all out of Christmas that Christmas has to offer, bow down. Now, you can bow later mandatorily or you can bow now voluntarily. But all creation will bow down. He says, over the earth, on earth, and under the earth. There will be no one who does not bow, whether in heaven, on earth, or in hell. All creation will be the recognition of the sun. What is Christmas? It's a fresh opportunity to remind you as you approach this new year, bow down. Recognize his lordship and confess it. The word confess means to say the same thing. It means to to agree with God on who Jesus is. That's why even Paul says in Romans chapter 10, if we confess him, we get delivered by him. He's talking to Christians there. And I know we use that passage evangelistically, but he's really talking to Christians about agreeing with the son. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 10, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my father. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my father. What is he saying? It is the recognition and agreement with God about me that gains you attention in heaven. It is the denial or the refusal to confess me that gets you signed off in heaven. It is the recognition of the son. That means you can't be a secret agent Christian, a spiritual CIA representative or a covert operative. As I like to say, everybody else is coming out the closet, so you might as well come out too. And Christmas is a reminder to come out and be known as a follower of Christ that I belong to Jesus Christ and that I bow down. We talked about the inconvenience of the wise men, how they traveled over a long distance. We are all familiar with football fans. Let's look at a typical football day to make my point. There are only 17 minutes of action in an actual football game. 17 minutes of actual physical contact. Now, all this attention is for 17 minutes of actual contact. Now, this 17 minutes is part of a one-hour game. The game game clock is one hour, but there's only 17 minutes of contact in that one hour. Some of those minutes are people huddling or people going back to the huddle on a running play where the clock does not stop. So it's a one-hour game that has 17 minutes of actual activity. But the one hour game with the 70 minutes of activity is part of a three hour experience. So if you watch a football game, you're going to be sitting there for three hours. When you look at the halftime and the timeouts and all of that, you know, the clock stops on a pass play, an incomplete pass. So now 70 minutes of action that's part of a one hour game has now grown into a three hour experience. If you go to the game, That's two hours worth of drive time from the time you leave your house, deal with the traffic, park and walk to the stadium. So now 17 minutes of action in a one hour game. That's a three hour experience is now a five hour day. But now you got to get back home. (laughs) So you got another couple of hours because you got to walk to the car. You got to work through the traffic to get home. So 70 minutes worth of action in a one hour game, that's a three hour experience, has now become a seven hour day. Interesting. When you get home, if you're a real football fan, you're gonna watch Sports Center or NFL Network to show you clips of what you just saw. (laughs) So 17 minutes worth of action in a one hour game that's now a three hour experience in a seven hour day has now been expanded to review everything you just saw. On top of all of that, you're spending your week with fantasy football if you're a real football fan. So you're spending your week making projections on players and games and all of that all week long. In fact, 
you're going to even discuss it at work around the water cooler. That's right. <laughs> Why? Because in your mind and heart, football deserves every week your undivided attention. And you know why it does that? Because you're not merely a fan, you're a follower. What you just entered into was bowing down to a worship service around a pigskin. You have adored it, worshiped it, cherished it, followed it. You even paid your tithes when you walked in the stadium. I mean, you know, you brought your gold and frankincense, and you, you paid your tithes. Because you've decided this ball is worth me bowing down, not only for seven hours that day, but it will carry on my thoughts all week long and I will anticipate my next worship service. Well now, if you can bow down to pigskin and you consider it worthy of all of that, Christmas should have no problem getting your undivided attention and causing you to be like the wise men, you bow down. A man that, who died was one day having an auction of all of his valuables. And he was a very wealthy man who passed away. And so everyone knew how wealthy this man was. And so because they knew how wealthy this man was, uh, they knew that all of the things he was going to be auctioning was going to be very valuable and expensive. So the day of the auction came and they all gathered. When they all gathered, the auctioneer came and he hit the gavel and he said, the auction is now open. The first thing we're going to auction is a picture, a painting of this man's son. So they were going to auction this picture of this man's son and so the portrait came out and he said, who will start the bidding? No one responded because they were interested in all the other expensive stuff. This was just a regular painting of a boy. There wasn't anything special about this. It wasn't real expensive stuff. He said, the floor is open for a bid. No one bid it. He said, does not anyone want this picture of the man's son? The man had a servant who had worked for him when he was alive. And the servant, seeing that no one was bidding on the son, raised his hand and said, well, you know, if no one will else will take it, I'll take it. The servant said, I'll, I'll take the picture of the son. The auctioneer said, well, since nobody's bidding on the son, uh, we will let the servant take this picture of the son off of the hands of this auction. When the servant came and picked up the son, the auctioneer hit the gavel and he said, the auction is now over. Everybody's looking around. What do you mean the auction is just all over? You just, all you did was bring out the picture of the son. He said, I know. But in the will of the Father, All right. he willed that whoever took the picture of the Son got everything else. He wound up with everything simply because he took the Son. Because with the Son came everything else. There's a lot of stuff out here for Christmas being offered you. A lot of it's expensive, valuable. It has the glitz and the glitter of the holiday. But at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. So whatever else you're looking for in life and in this world and during this holiday season, take the son. Because whoever gets the son gets anything and everything else God has prescribed for them if they bow. This Christmas, bow down. And let's discover in this new year what the... A very familiar text that I would like to talk about for a few moments is 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12.
because Paul is struggling with something. We've been talking over the last few weeks from the subject, God, why are you killing me? Because sometimes you feel like God is not on your side. Instead of the great God that you know and love making things better and better, it seems the more you call on him, he seems to be letting them get worse and worse. Such was Paul's situation in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It's hard to live in the sunshine when your life is full of fog. You know the sun is up there somewhere, you just can't see it because your vision, your sight of vision is very limited and very narrow. Paul says in verse 7 these words, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Paul says, I had a thorn. The Greek word for thorn was used of a splinter or a needle or a fish hook, the point of a fish hook. It was an ongoing irritation that he couldn't shake. He calls it a thorn. We've grown up and many of us have put our hands in the thorn bushes and have been cut and had that thorn stick. Perhaps you've had a thorn or a splinter in your finger and you couldn't get at it. You get a needle and you're digging and digging and digging. In fact, the more you try to get rid of it, the worse things get if you can't get rid of it because you're trying to get rid of it. You're trying to get rid of this thing, this situation, this pain, this needling, and it's driving you crazy. He says, I had a thorn in the flesh. It was related to my physical life. Now, Paul doesn't tell us what the thorn is. There are many guesses. We know from statements that Paul makes in, throughout the New Testament, he had eye problems. He says in one place, I've written with large letters so that you could read them, so that he had to be able to see to write. He talks about eyes in a number of cases. So yeah, they could have had an eye problem. So it could have been a physical thorn. He talks in another place about many of the burdens that he faced distress and persecutions and, and all these mass shipwreck. And so it could have been a circumstantial burden in his life. Any number of burdens or needling. My guess, and it's a guess because he doesn't say, well, maybe he says, it depends on how you interpret it, because he says in this verse, a messenger of Satan. So it could be a person in his life who's driving him crazy. Anybody have a messenger of the devil? The Bible talks about Satan having human messengers, people who are demonically inspired to make our lives miserable. And you can't get rid of them. You know, maybe you work next to them and nobody's getting transferred. Nobody's getting relocated. Nobody's getting fired. And you can't shake it. Maybe you live with them. And they're messengers of the devil. In fact, sometimes we say that about people. You ain't nothing but the devil, right? We say that about people. So it could have been a person. But, but we don't know, no, because he doesn't say. We do know that it was the devil behind it. And the devil, through whatever this thorn was, was making life horrific. Horrific. It was needling him, and he couldn't shake it. He couldn't do anything about it. He couldn't get rid of it. Here's something you need to know about a thorn, and it's a critical principle. It's a difficult one to accept, but it's critical if you're going to deal with the thorn. 
nothing but nothing gets to you, even if it's from the devil that doesn't pass through God's fingers first. The devil is not sovereign, God is. He's powerful, but he's not sovereign. Even God said to the devil, have you considered my servant Job? So the devil only got to mess with Job because God okayed it. So we've got to get something straight and it may shake your theology. It may make your theology uncomfortable to know that God, here it is, will sometimes use the devil to carry out his purposes. Now that, that can mess with you a little bit. That can throw you off a little bit because when, because our, our position is God and the devil are at odds with one another. They're at war with one another. They disagree with one another. It's good versus evil. But God, in his purposes, will at times use the devil to fulfill God's purposes. Peter told Jesus, everybody's going to forsake you except me. In Luke 22, I am your man. I am never going to leave you and forsake me. Jesus tells Peter, Satan has requested to sift you as wheat. Satan has made a request to have you. Which means... Satan gets to you by permission because he made a request. He has requested to sift you as wheat. Then Jesus said, but I'm praying for you that your faith fail not. So Satan has to get approval. Sometimes, many times, maybe even most of the time, God blocks him but not all the time. Not all the time. Why? I raised the question, why? Why would God allow the devil to get to me as one of his children? A number of reasons. Number one, this is the positive is a positive reason and a negative reason. Let me give you the positive. The positive reason is to increase your anointing. Let me say it again. The positive reason that God will allow the devil to get to you is to increase your anointing. Now, what do I mean by that? To expand your usefulness for God. God will let the devil mess with you so that you can experience more of God. Notice what he says, verse 7, first line, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations. For this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was giving me a thorn. Because of all that God had done and was going to do through me, he allowed Satan in. So I have some good news, even though you won't be happy to hear it. For those who have thorns, irritants, that you want to shake and you're trying to shake, but they won't go away. God has something special for you. I've got good news for you. Now you're feeling bad about it because it's a thorn, it's an irritant. But the good news is, God has something special for you. If you read the first portion of chapter 12, Paul has been escorted into the third heaven to see things no other man has ever seen. He's the only man who has been escorted or translated to heaven who's been allowed to come back to earth to talk about it. He said, I saw things that are unlawful to utter. In other words, I can't even tell you what I saw. It would blow your mind, he says. I can't, I've been held in secret. It would be Paul 
who would author 13 books in the New Testament, the largest New Testament writer. It would be Paul who would pen the theology of the church, the book of Romans. It would be Paul who would be, who would be the master influencer of Christianity for the ages. God gave him a great revelation for a great purpose. So what I want you to do now in your thorn, if you happen to have one right now that you're dealing with, is I want you to know God has something special going on. The negative side of the thorn. To keep me from exalting myself, there was giving me a thorn in the flesh, a message of Satan, to torment me. Oh. So this thing is driving me crazy. To torment me. To keep me from exalting myself. The other reason God gives a thorn is to correct an actual or potential sin in our lives. Here was the sin of pride. See, when you've been to the third heaven and you're the only one that's been there, <laughs> you're the only one on earth who can talk in detail about what heaven is like. You, there is nobody but you. You are the man. You are the one. It's easy to get the big head if you're the only one. And he's the only one. Nobody can do that but him. That tells us that Paul either had the problem or had the propensity for the problem of pride. So God put something in his life to keep him humble. Something in his life as a reminder that his anointing, his calling, he was never to become boastful about. Something that when he was tempted to exalt himself would pull him right back down. God put a needle to burst the balloon. Because you know, you blow a balloon up, it gets the big head. It gets inflated. God kept this needle in there to torment him to bring him back down to earth. So that means he had it or had the propensity for it. It's not that he didn't pray about it, verse 8. Concerning this, I employed the Lord three times that it might leave me. Lord, get this off of me. Get me away from this person. Get me away from this situation. There's been a situation where every time it looked like you're about to get out, you get drugged back in. He says, I'm talking to God. I, I'm talking to God about three times. One of the questions people will often ask is, how often do you pray about something? The answer, till you get one. Why did he stop after three times? Because he said, and he said to me. He got a response. So you keep talking about talking to God until he gives you a response, but you give him the freedom to give you a response. And he has to have the freedom to give you his response, not the response you want him to give you. He said, he said to me, so there was a word from God. That's a rhema word. Because he said it to me. See, that's a rhema word. A, ray, a rhema word is a specific utterance with your name on it, not a general message for everybody. This isn't, this isn't an envelope with occupant on it. This is an envelope that's been mailed to you. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Translation, I am not going to take away your thorn. 
But what I am going to do is give you something to handle the thorn that I'm not going to take away. My grace is sufficient. I don't want you to even turn to it now, but if you have not memorized 2 Corinthians 9, 8, just make a note and memorize it. That verse will hold you steady when life is tormenting you. And it relates to this phrase, my grace. I have enough grace for you to handle this. His prayer was, get it off me. He said, get, get it off me. I pray that it might leave me. God's answer was, my grace is sufficient for this needle. But the good news is, it's because of the greater revelation. There's something bigger going on here than, that you can't see right now. Well, what's this grace going to do? My power is perfected in weakness. I'm going to make you weaker and I'm going to use the devil to do it. I'm going to use the devil to make you weaker so that you can see my power. God will never be more real to you than when you have something in your life you cannot fix. You can't fix it. You, the thorn won't go away. Nothing you try gets rid of it. And you feel weak. Helpless. 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 You don't know where to turn. You don't know to whom to turn. You don't know if to turn. You are helpless. He says, my grace is sufficient because with my grace comes the power in the midst of your weakness. Therefore, it must not be your power because he just told you, you were weak. Well, what am I supposed to do? Most gladly then. I will boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Okay, are you sitting down? Well, I know you are, but that's rhetorical. <laughs> are you sitting down? Did you just see what he said? In my weakness, because I'm tormented in this situation and I can't change when I discovered the principle of grace, of the sufficiency of grace, God's supply is enough for my situation. And this torment is making me weaker. God just said that his power is perfected or matured or developed when I'm weaker. Follow this now. The needle is making me weaker. The torment is making me weaker. It's, it's, it's breaking me down. He says, well, in that brokenness, God is actually setting up a power plant. I will therefore most gladly boast about my weakness. Now, that's not what we do. We complain about our weakness. Lord, this thing is killing me. This thing is driving me crazy. I can't make it. He said, I'm going to brag about it. He says, if weak is how I get strong, since I want to be strong, I'm going to brag about weak. Your weakness. See, we want to praise because it's all right. He says, praise when it's all wrong. Hallelujah. Notice the responsibility. He says, power is perfected in weakness. 
I would rather boast in my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. In other words, I have it, I want to experience it. And what's going to make what I have my experience? My boasting. My making a big deal in the midst of my deep anguish. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, insults, distresses, persecutions, difficulties, for Christ's sake, because I'm maintaining my Christian position. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That goes against every fiber of our being. That goes against what's natural. That goes against every advice we would give anybody or that anybody would give us. That, that's, not, that's not normal to boast in my weakness. To say, God, this thorn in my life, I pray that you take it. I want you to take it. He's not condemned for praying that it goes away. I want to. Artificial night, a city starts to breathe. Hope rekindled, whispering. 